None of us chooses the hour or the place or the circumstances of our birth. We do not choose our parents, our ethnicity, our native language, our physical features, or our non-physical characteristics. We come from, as 19th century Scottish writer George MacDonald put it, out of the everywhere into here. But that here, not the here, is different for each one of us, and this difference is what we have in common. We belong to a humanity that is perpetually in media res. Each of us is born into the middle of others' stories, and others are born into ours, into Kenneth Burke's unending conversation, as it were. Diane Davis draws on Burke's thought that belonging is fundamentally rhetorical, and suggests the more originary rhetoricity must already be operating based on a fundamental structure of exposure and an always prior openness to the other's affection as its first requirement. And we are, fundamentally, exposed. In our gestation, we are exposed to our mother's blood flowing into and through us. Her body is open to being affected by our presence, and our body is open to being affected by her presence. Each one of us experiences this commonality oblivious to borders, as Davis puts it, that precedes and exceeds symbolic identification and therefore any prerequisite for belonging. We come into this world physically naked, emotionally vulnerable, intellectually susceptible, and immersed in an originary or pre-originary rhetoricity, an affectability or persuadability that is the condition for symbolic interaction. Rickert writes, the conjectures we call identification, commonality, and community work from, have their spaces of possibility hollowed in advance by this a priori affectability, and says this ambient rhetoric appears as a rich sense of background, as a cradle to human interaction. In a sort of chicken-egg question, Rickard asks, to what extent can we discuss materiality prior to meaning or symbolicity, and how can we discuss what gives rise to symbolicity as part of symbolicity itself? Latour suggests we return to the experience of the love crisis that allows us to discover angels bearing tumults of the soul, primarily because those angels bear not messages but something else. This is what makes it comprehensible to the simple-minded and to children, Latour writes, and what conceals it right away from the wise and the scholarly. For the latter do not want speech to flow, they want it to transport the literal with no distortions. Here it is flowing again, overflowing, passing by way of parables, plunging into rituals, getting a grip on itself in a sermon, snaking around in a prayer, circulating indifferently at first, and then suddenly converting, just like that. P.L. Travers suggests babies bring the language of the everywhere into this world with them, then lose it in the process of learning a new one. In Mary Poppins, for instance, the infant twins John and Barbara converse with the sunlight and the starlings, with each other and with Mary Poppins, converse rhetorically, but they don't understand why Michael and Jane don't speak starling or wind. They understood once, said Mary Poppins, folding up one of Jane's nightgowns, but, but how is it they've forgotten at all, said John, trying to understand. Because they've grown older, explained Mary Poppins. That's a silly reason, said John, looking sternly at her. It's the true one, then, Mary Poppins said. In Mary Poppins Comes Back, Travers revisits this idea with newborn Annabelle, who not only speaks sunlight and wind, but also recalls her passage from the dark, where all things have their beginning, and who heard the stars singing as I came. Within a week, however, Annabelle too has forgotten the journey. What else have we forgotten on our journey from everywhere into here? Jenny Rice speaks of memory as an orienting horizon which provides a means of comparison, but gives contrasting examples of how comparison might lead one group of people to see development, for example, as a problem, while another group sees it as a solution. Rice suggests creating alternative places for speaking and writing differently about problems, and Claire Vanderpool's Moon Over Manifest illustrates this as 12-year-old Abilene digs into the town of Manifest past and begins retelling the stories forgotten in the devastation of World War I and the Spanish influenza, and the suffocation of hope caused by the Depression. In searching for her father's history, his story, Abilene helps the town remember how they once worked together to build a future. Vanderpool drew inspiration for Moon Over Manifest from a line in Herman Melville's Moby Dick. It's not down in any map. True places never are. And at the end of Manifest, Abilene is told, 
the line between truth and myth is sometimes difficult to see. Jeff Rice in Digital Detroit suggests the city told itself a story through the use of place names, a romanticized view of the urban, a whimsical song about the Model T, and later, the mythologies of the race riots and the assembly line. Today, Rice claims photographic recitations of abandoned buildings produce communal, not personal, responses. Horizons and mythologies are choices we make. If we choose to focus only on the horizon nearest us and only on the loudest, most familiar narrative, then our standard of comparison will be shallow. It takes courage, as Kant reminded us, to believe a more distant horizon exists. It takes an ear actively open to listening past the litany of this world's woes to catch a more distant song, one that sings of ruins as new spaces for recreative possibilities. Even if we no longer remember the language of everywhere, we can affirm that we once were fluent in it. It's easy to look outside for answers to our problems and conundrums, to believe the grass is greener on the other side of the fence or the other side of the road, but the crossing really is within. It is a continual act in the Dasein present, the Kairos of now. It is an act of authorship. We authorize a different possible narrative when we choose to focus on the more distant horizon and the more distant song. And in this sense, then, the author never really dies, but keeps authorizing a new here and here and here until he or she re-enters everywhere.